Good morning, everyone. So as an extension of our lecture about the nature of genre, we are going to be talking about superhero stories, and particularly how they pertain to adolescent ideas of masculinity. There we go. So, superhero stories present ideals of masculinity towards which their readers can aspire. Or, if we want to phrase that critically, superhero stories are power fantasies about being masculine. So consider all of the semiotics involved in the character of Batman, right? What does Batman represent? He is cold and logical. He is driven and dedicated, obsessive, that he is physically powerful. He is always right, right? There aren't a lot of stories where Batman says, Jesus Christ, guys, I fucked up. This is all my fault. Um, he is always, he always has moral authority. He is always, he is rich beyond wildest imaginings, right? So, and because he has all of these things, Batman is licensed by the stories in which he appears to sort of act unilaterally. And so Batman, by being this collection of traditionally masculine notions, both uh, masculine notions of physicality and I think even more importantly of like masculine ideals of intellectualism is allowed to act unilaterally. So this is just a collection of uh, tropes associated with uh, superheroes and as we talked about a genre is essentially a collection of tropes and then a grammar by which those tropes interact with one another, right? It's a bunch of shit that's gonna happen in a way that it's probably going to happen. So, right, costumes and secret identity are linked to one another. You don't need a costume to have a secret identity. The costume often draws a lot of attention to the dual identity, if anything. But those tropes kind of handed down from, you know, even before superhero stories, we had Zorro and the Scarlet Pimpernel. We had this idea of, like, the masked swashbuckler who hides his identity so that he can go, you know, get into sword fights with his rich friends. Um, has really become part and parcel of superhero stories. The idea that you have some kind of special power Often this is supernatural in nature, right? That the Flash can run super, super fast. Um, that, um, <coughs> uh, excuse me, um, or that, you know, Superman can fly and shoot lasers out of his eyes. But even in, you know, characters like Batman or Green Arrow, they still have power, which is, while not explicitly supernatural, is still superhuman. That Batman is this you know, has these powers of deduction, that he has these powers of hand-to-hand -hand combat prowess, of stealth and infiltration, of wealth and resources. Um, Supervillains are often reflections of either the same set of ideals or a sort of inversion of them, right? So you have... Uh, a character like the Flash, whose arch nemesis is literally named Reverse Flash. <laughs> his, his main supervillain is him but evil, right? And this makes for, you know, easy storytelling about, you know, where you're kind of neck and neck, you have the same set of powers, you have similar backstories. Or the uh, supervillain is often a contrast to the superhero. And usually what this means is that the superhero is defined by physical attributes and the supervillain is defined by mental attributes. So 
I refer to these as jock beating up nerd stories. Superman, he can build all the robots he wants. He's always going to be a dumb jock, right? He's always going to be defined by his, uh, you know, his physical prowess. Lex Luthor, no matter how much he deadlifts, he is always going to be defined by his intellectual prowess. Um, you know, Shazam and Dr. Savannah, a uh, little bit of a deep cut. But similar thing, a physical superhero who beats up an intellectual bad guy. Uh, Thor and Loki, right? Thor is the big dumb himbo. Loki is the cunning, devious schemer. So going back to this idea of masculinity, um, even when we have characters like, you know, uh, Batman or Iron Man, who do represent these intellectual aspirations, physical aspirations always seem to come to the forefront of them. Uh, and we're going to talk about things like uh, love interests a little bit later on when we talk about uh, the sort of gendered nature of this. So, superheroes represent an adolescent male power fantasy. An average guy can imagine becoming a superhero. Handsome and strong, able to beat up anyone, be respected by other men, and win the heart of the beautiful woman he longs for. If only he too could be bit by the right radioactive spider, be given a secret word by a creepy old wizard in a subway station, have a dying alien give him a powerful ring, or get hit by lightning and chemicals at the same time. Right? So this last paragraph goes into this idea of that superhero identities are transformative and sudden. These comics present an obvious allegory of pubescent metamorphosis, as one could imagine. The Hulk is a perfect analogy for this, right? That bimpy, insecure Bruce Banner transforms into the ultra-physically strong, uh, you know, physically tough, impulsive Hulk. And that almost all superhero origin stories, with some notable exceptions I'm going to talk about, have some kind of transformative aspect to them. Something happens to you, and in a moment, you are suddenly someone else, right? That, oh, imagine, remember being 13, guys? Um, but moreover, that, that someone that you become is a better, more desirable person than the person you were, right? So Barry Allen didn't decide to become the Flash. He didn't work at it. He just got hit by lightning, and he suddenly was the Flash. Um, right? Uh, Shazam was a, you know, a boy who was sort of chosen by a wizard. Uh, Peter Parker, you know, gets bit by a spider and he mutates. His body changes, um, into one that's more strong and agile. So, you know, Bruce Banner, right? Um, he's affected by gamma radiation and suddenly he turns into the Hulk. Um, so all of these have this kind of pubescent, metamorphic quality to them. And we're going to go through a couple origin stories to illustrate this. Right, so Spider-Man is, I think, probably the best known origin story, or certainly was before um, every superhero movie was an origin story movie. Excuse me? Um... And again, that he's, Spider-Man is particularly, I think, illustrative of that because he is himself a teenager when he is bit by the spider. He is already going through pubescent metamorphosis and then that pubescent metamorphosis takes on this extra characteristic of making him a superhero. Um, Captain America, right? that he was this scrawny weakling and then some scientists gave him drugs 
And he turns into this, you know, powerful, this is as best as they could do with the limited art style of the 1940s, you know, uh, this, but this powerful, beautiful Adonis that he is jacked and he is handsome and he is super strong and that it happens instantaneously. Um, I love this. So this is one of those exceptions that really just drives the lesson home more, right? Superman doesn't have a transformative story. He was born with superpowers, or at least the potential for them, right? His uh, power comes from soaking up solar radiation because he's a Kryptonian. And so in the 1960s, um, they did the this Superman spinoff called Superboy, um, where Superman is a teenager and he's developing his powers for the first time. And so Superman's powers literally came about by him going through puberty. <laughs> um, and so it really drives home the whole pubescent metamorphosis angle. And the rise of teenage superheroes in the 1980s uh, with things like the second wave of X-Men, the Teen Titans, um, all of this kind of really focused in of like, oh, maybe our, you know, teenage target readers would like to read about characters who are also teenagers and want to experience that metamorphosis rather than have it something that is in the past. Um, so this is a contrast example. Um, if any of you watched Dragon Ball Z growing up, um, you will recall that it is like 70% training montage by volume. And unlike Western superheroes, uh, Goku and his contemporaries in, you know, Bleach and Naruto, all that, their power is not something that happens suddenly. It is something that happens gradually over the course of time. Whereas Spider-Man instantaneously becomes Spider-Man, and the Flash instantaneously becomes the Flash, Goku is constantly training. He is constantly becoming a slightly better version of himself. Um, and even Western superheroes whose origin story involves some element of training or some element, right, characters like Batman and Daredevil and Iron Fist, that training is all in the past, right? There's no story where Green Arrow becomes a better archer. He is already the best archer in the world when his stories come to pass. All that stuff where he gets washed up on an island and has to learn how to survive and get super good at archery because of that, that's done. So superheroes are fundamentally not growth stories. They are stories about being grown, right? They are something that you can look to as an after puberty, like that this is a someone I could be, not someone who you are as you're going through puberty. All right, switching topics a bit. So this is an ad that ran in superhero comics for many, many years for uh, Charles Atlas's bodybuilding program, um, right? And... Uh, bodybuilding is absurdly hard work that takes an incredibly long time, but it's selling this fantasy that you can subscribe to this program and you will transform as though overnight from this skinny loser to this jacked dude uh, who can, you know, beat up other people at the beach instead of getting beat up at the beach. Let's talk about getting the girl. Uh, so superheroes have overwhelmingly some element of compulsory heterosexuality involved in their stories. Um, and that there is almost always some kind of love interest character who forms a love triangle 
between the superhero self, the wimpy human, you know, secret identity self, and then the girl herself. Right? So we have Lois Lane, who doesn't really give a shit about her dopey co-worker Clark Kent. She's really into this Superman guy. Let me actually go back a little a step. Um, and so the so this idea of getting the girl, which is so ubiquitous in all, you know, <laughs> all media, I would dare say, with maybe a very handful of exceptions, um, is part and parcel of superhero stories because that's part of being this masculine ideal, is being desirable. And that with the, uh, particularly the way identity plays into this, and this is where we get, you know, these kind of chest hair moments, there's an idea that your best qualities are being hidden, that the world doesn't understand how great you are or how great you could become. So that when Stacy doesn't want to go to prom with you, it's not because you're undesirable. It's because the world has yet to see you for how great you are. And so the secret identity trope has a lot going on with it. Not all of it related to this concept of adolescent masculinity, but there is this idea that lurking inside your skin there is someone else that you can become and that that someone else is someone who will be desired and will be respected even if you are not. So this now we're going to talk about body image with superhero stories, right? Um, the Hulk being kind of, you know, the classic example but even when we look at characters like Batman and Iron Man, who are wearing like full suits of body armor, that body armor is still sculpted to have this kind of masculine, muscular silhouette, right? Like, Iron Man's armor has biceps. <laughs> Why does it have biceps? Um, right? There's these you know, kind of, uh, Batman's chest plate has pecs carved into it. Uh, oh, we're going to go back for a second. Um, my God, he's got this huge cod piece on, right? Like that, you know, he's got abs drawn on his, uh, body armor. So even when the physique itself is being concealed by the costume, um, it is still a huge part of how superheroes are presented. And that so much of it, because it is about the physical metamorphosis of going through a kind of puberty, even if it's a heavily metaphorical puberty, is that at the end of it, you will have this idealized body and you will no longer have this scrawny, childlike body. All right, now we can talk about, whoops. Going the wrong way, bop, 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 Batman, Tobey Maguire Man, right? Um, anyone remember this movie? The 2001 Sam Raimi Spider-Man? So there's a scene of after uh, Peter Parker gets bit by the spider for the first time of him just, like, checking himself out in the mirror. I'm like, holy shit, I gained, like, pecs and abs and delts overnight. Um, and the... Um, Sam Raimi Spider-Man movie is go ahead and watch it again if you've got time because it doesn't just double down it triples down on this puberty metaphor right like <laughs> I'm pretty sure there's a scene during this where uh, Tobey Maguire like you know pulls his pants open and looks at his crotch and sees like that his genitals have changed from being bitten by a spider um, they, you know, Spider-Man has this signature, you know, ability of shooting webs, pew, 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 which traditionally were like a device that he built and wore under his costume. But in this, 
they made it a physical mutation that he can't control, that he's just, like, ejaculating spider webs left and right. Um, I, I personally find this movie a little bit, a lot bit on the nose with its puberty metaphors, but Spider-Man is really the place where you see this the most clearly. Or perhaps that title should go to Shazam and his gritty 1990s reboot Prime. Um, oh, the 90s were a weird fucking place in comics, if none of you remember that. Gross and disgusting. Ultraverse. Um, that... So Shazam is... His secret identity is that he is a child, right? This is Billy Batson. This is Shazam. But when he says a magic word, he turns into a huge jacked adult who can fly and shoot lightning and has all these powers. Prime, this being the 90s, is an even scrawnier child who turns into an even jackter dude who is just barely wearing a shirt. Um, and that... So, it really... Captain Marvel really focuses in on that... Uh, suddenness of the transformative experience, right? This idea that one day you're a child and the next day you're an adult. And what kind of adult are you going to be? And is it the type of person that you want to be? So uh, we've got a kind of clip show going from uh, Captain America, uh, the first Avenger, the, the first Captain America movie, where they digitally scronified uh, Chris Evans, right, and this idea of, as Dr. Brown put it, literally not measuring up when he sees himself in the mirror. He's the skinniest guy, he's still skinny. Um, and then, boop, boop, here comes some drugs, here comes science, and now he's this, you know, huge jack dude with a, you know, 46 inch chest and a six pack. Uh, and that, again, this happens instantaneously. And if you compare the way these bodies are presented, that his pre transformation self, his old self, is, even though he's, you know, an adult in these movies, he has this childlike adolescent body. And then he transforms into having this sort of ultra-muscular, ultra-masculine physique. And that that physique is a thing of desire and admiration, right? We have Peggy Carter sort of just reaching out to stroke his boobs there, uh, his mighty, mighty pectorals. Um, we have these two guys in the back who are just so fucking psyched. You did it, man. You got that ripped beach bod. Um, Hugh Jackman was very famous for this, that over the course of the X-Men movies, he got increasingly into CrossFit, and so he went from, I don't know, I don't, I don't, he's not doughy, but he's not a particularly noticeable physique in the first X-Men movies, he's probably walking around at like 12-15% body fat, um... And then here he is later on, you know, with his, like, stomach veins and his chest striations at, like, 3% body fat. Um, he's gotten, he's done that thing that all bodybuilders aspire to of getting so shredded that they're actually, they go back to being unattractive again. Um, and that... Um, you're right. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, Henry Cavill as Superman. Uh, it was pointed out to me. I was like, why does Superman need to be jacked? He He's not super strong because he lifts weights. He's super strong because of the sun. Um, and that uh, also it, noticeably different uh, between, you know, Superman and Wolverine versus Chris Evans back here. Chris Evans is just, like, a perfectly shaven manscape here, right? Not a uh, hair on his chest. Whereas 
uh, you know, Henry Cavill is like auditioning for like bear of the year with this look, right? With his beard and his chest hair that there was this kind of lumberjack masculinity versus maybe we'll tentatively call surfer masculinity. Um, that is sort of competing for body image within these stories. Like are, are male bodies supposed to, you know, they're supposed to be big and muscly, but are they supposed to be muscly and smooth? Are they supposed to be muscly and hairy? And this is like a weirdly contentious topic in our society. Um, go on any, if you ever get a YouTube or Facebook ad for like a male body hair razor, read the comments on the, that ad because it is fucking wild how like defensive people get about this issue. Um, Chris Evans, speaking of surfers, here he is. I believe this is in Point Break where he's looking fairly shredded, but you know, also fairly lightly built to just being impossibly jacked when he uh, played Thor in um, the Marvel Cinematic Universe. You know, like, in this movie, they even comment on it. It's like, you know, hey, you know, this Thor guy, he's weirdly cut for a crazy homeless dude. Um, or like in the Avengers, you know, it's like, oh, I don't think Thor is really a god. Are you sure? Have you seen his arms? Um, uh, that his physique is on display so much uh in these movies and that he is portraying this again a masculine ideal and also also i would say a very different masculine ideal from someone like batman that you know batman is like cold and rational and always serious whereas thor is like kind of dumb and jovial um this one was added in just for uh you know, contrast, this is Christian Bale in The Machinist, where he uh, lost a bunch of weight. Christian Bale in Batman Begins, where he got really jacked. Um, there's a joke that if you want a surefire Oscar in Hollywood, just lose or gain a bunch of weight, and it doesn't matter what else you do. Um, but again, the, the actors will undergo these physical transformations in order to portray these bodies because superheroes are so much about portraying a masculine frame. Um, yes, uh, Chris Pratt, right? He did the opposite. He went from being the fat guy on Parks and Recreation to being super jacked in Guardians of the Galaxy. Um, uh, here it is being lampshaded in an episode of The Flash. You know, what? Lightning gave me abs? Right? And that Barry Allen's powers, The Flash's powers, are purely supernatural in origin. That he is, right? That this lightning tied him to a cosmic bullshit called the Speed Force. And now he runs super good. And that, right... There's no reason why this needs to be reflected in his physique, according to sort of the canon of the story. But in order to fulfill that role of, you know, this identity of being a superhero, he needs to have an athletic body. Um, oh, yeah, this is great. Um, so these are Lego figurines where, you know, they all have the same kind of, you know, trapezoidal torsos, but then they draw on a physique. So Batman and Superman here have abs, and Wonder Woman and Batgirl have what appear to be corsets on, right? That they have these hourglass shapes that are just sort of... God, this is so weird, because it's like it's got a frame around it on Wonder Woman's. Um... The dying print industry has really capitalized on this, right? Every men's health issue is about ways to get abs. Sculpted abs in one move. Great abs made easy. 18 to 8 abs. Um, six pack diet. Uncover your abs. Right? Men's health issues aren't actually about men's health. They're about men's physique. 
Um, I guess there is a little bit of, you know, fight cancer with coffee. But there's not, like, men's health. Be sure to get a prostate exam this year. Men's health. Men are more likely to, you know, you know, watch out for depression. Uh, men's health. How to avoid losing all your friends in your 30s, right? No. It's really when they say health, they mean physique. Um, oh yeah, here is just a pic that Doc Brown threw in of Wolverine expressing his own version of masculinity, right? Jacked, drinking whiskey, full of bullet holes, and just not giving a shit. Um, and that this is where superhero stories start portraying different versions of masculinity. Is it more masculine to be passionate? Like, the Hulk? <laughs> or is it more masculine to be detached, like Wolverine is here? And that, you know, the range of emotions that men are allowed to express is often very narrow, very limited to destructive emotion. You know, it's okay to be mad, but it's not okay to be sad. Um, that sort of thing. Um, here's... Just some more of Captain America getting fondled um, again. And th this goes back to this idea of that the superhero represents being respected. Even, like, with stories where the superhero is being prosecuted, like where, you know, uh, the Daily Bugle is talking about Spider-Man is a loose cannon. I was like... He, it's still kind of being respected, right? It's like, you're too cool for this school, Spider-Man. You're a loose cannon, Batman. You're a dangerous element because you play by your own rules, right? Um, it's not really... They might be being condemned by actors in the story, but they're not being condemned by the story itself. Um, and this goes back to getting the girl. Um, that, you know, being respected means that the people who you like will like you, that your love interest will love you back. Um, here's just a whole bunch of superhero makeout scenes. This one was very, very famous, um, right? Spider-Man kissing upside down in the rain. Um, I believe that's The Flash and Iris West, who I think is his, like, stepsister? It's kind of weird. Um, right, Batman and Catwoman, um, Thor and Jane Austen, um, Jane Austen? No, um, Jane Foster, there we go. Um, I think there's another slide of these, yeah. Um, the worst one, uh, Ant-Man and the Wasp here, who have, like, a completely antagonistic relationship throughout the whole movie, but then at the end, Hank Pym walks in on them making out, because... You have to hit this beat. The hero has to get the girl at the end. And every, I count it, every single Marvel film has a romantic subplot, except for one. Whoops. Um, which I'll get to in a moment. I thought that was my next slide. Um, so these are just superhero costumes for children. And you'll notice that they've got, like, muscles kind of crudely sewn into them, right? Even Iron Man, right? He's wearing a breastplate, but that breastplate has abs. Uh, same thing. Batman, he's wearing body armor, but his body armor has pecs. Wonder Woman, not so much. Um, and so, the role of superheroines in this media is one that I think is still largely being articulated, right? Because it is... The superhero story is so rooted in a male notion of adolescence and, you know, what comes after that we're not 100% sure what to do yet when we have these uh, female superheroes. They tend to be a little bit outliers. Uh, more muscle sculpt. And yeah, and we can see the kind of different way that bodies are portrayed often. Um, and that... Wonder Woman, I should have put a slide of Wonder Woman in here, but it's okay, is not super jacked, right? Like, Gal Gadot is kind of tiny. 
when she's drawn, she's usually more curvaceous than she is muscular. Um, right? She doesn't look like Ronda Rousey. Um, and that... So the female body that's being aspired to is not the same kind of male body that's being aspired to. And it's often one that, you know, falls into more conventional... Uh, MTV tits and ass and big hair, um, if you'll pardon my language, models of femininity. That it is a version of femininity that is really rooted in male desire rather than female aspiration. Uh, yes. Um, so this is a classic one, uh, the boobs and butt pose wherein uh, superheroines are often uh, depicted, you know, doing this kind of half twist so that you can see their chest and you can see their butt at the same time. Um, the superheroes, not so much. does happen. If you look at the poster for Avengers, which I now realize I should have also put in this slideshow, um, but if you look at the movie poster for the movie Avengers, Tony Stark is 100% doing the boobs and butt pose, and it looks... Pretty silly. Um, but more traditionally, uh, male superheroes are fronted in this kind of square, you know, uh, neutral stance. Okay. So, I want to briefly talk about how this applies to femininity. So here's Captain Marvel. I mentioned earlier that there's only one MCU film that does not have a romance subplot, and that's Captain Marvel. And curiously... The incel community absolutely despises this movie. Um, go on YouTube, look up any set of comments from any clip of Captain Marvel, and the, like, misogynist hate for this movie is so palpable because Captain Marvel isn't really being framed. She's kind of, by existing challenging some of the gendered notions of this narrative, right? That, you know, people complain that, you know, oh, she has this, you know, sort of man-hating feminist energy, um, or that, you know, she's too powerful. Um, and she also goes through this kind of sudden transformative experience. Uh, she gets hit by some radiation and she can shoot beams out of her hands, and right? Um... And so superhero stories are still grappling with exactly where women fit into these narratives. Um, and when they basically just take the same narrative but change it to a woman instead, dudes get real mad. Um, so I believe that concludes my slideshow. I'm going to post your prompts for this week uh, in uh, the discussion board. And uh, thank you for watching. This went a little bit, a lot bit longer than I anticipated, but that's okay. Uh, thank you for listening, and I will see you later.